Hi, everyone. Today, I want to talk about the theory of perceptual adaptation that we find in the writings of the French phenomenologist Henri Bergson, especially as this is articulated in a lecture that Bergson gave at the Institut Psychologique in 1901, which incidentally is the same year that Freud published The Psychopathology of Everyday Life. And I actually like to read uh, Bergson and Freud um, as two different attempts in the early 20th century to break away from some of the core premises of mainstream psychology. So at the same time that Bergson is thinking about perception, so too Freud is making his own intervention into psychopathology. Now, in the 1901 lecture, Bergson talks about the active nature of perception. And against people like Descartes, he argues that perception cannot be a matter of the mind simply playing with innate ideas that it just carries within it, either because God gave them to us in order to fashion us after his image or ideas that we just carry with us by virtue of some metaphysical necessity. Rather, Bergson says, perception is always dependent on whatever material the senses put on the table for the mind to interpret. And this means that the mind cannot generate ideas except the ideas that come from the active interpretation of sensory data. Now, the philosophical problem here is that according to Bergson, the senses are actually quite limited and they never give us a full picture of reality. In fact, he says the senses give us a sketch of the real world. They give us almost like an outline or just a few trace lines without all the details filled in. And that's the job of the intellect. The intellect looks at the sketch of the world that is provided by the senses and then has to somehow fill that in. So how does the intellect do this? The answer is memory. According to Bergson, we have very powerful memories, and that means that our minds are constantly searching through our memory archives, both a short term and long term memory, in order to identify and retrieve the specific memory that best fits the sensory sketch that I have in front of me at any one point in time. And the mind then gives meaning to that sketch in light of the memory that it has used to fill it in. Now, Bergson gives two examples to highlight how this adaptation of memory to sensation or the past into the present operates. The first of these is the act of reading. Literally, when I pick up a book, um, like in this case, um, Nabokov and start reading in the case of English from left to right. Um, let me put this book down. So when we read, of course, we don't read word for word or letter by letter. Maybe we did that when we were beginning to learn to read when we were children, but as more mature consumers of text, we usually process meaning in larger structures. And this is an insight that Bergson picks up from Gestalt psychology, which became quite popular at the start of the 20th century. And so Bergson says, in the same way that we can capture the meaning and we understand the totality of the page without being given at the level of perception every single letter, so too when we perceive the world, we don't get all the details already filled out by the senses themselves. Sensation doesn't give you that. Rather, the mind does a filling in function, even if you don't register all the particulars. Now, the second example that Bergson gives is dreaming. And Bergson has a very peculiar interpretation of dreaming. To begin with, he rejects the idea that is quite common, which is that when we fall asleep and we go into the dream state, we lose our connection to the real world. Bergson says that's actually not quite true because I still feel the affectations of two different sources. There are internal sensations that I still feel when I'm asleep, the circulation of the blood, the state of the organs, uh, maybe even my heartbeat, all of that is still going on. And I am implicitly aware of that. But moreover, I also still get some affectation, some sensory affectation from the external world. Now, of course, my relationship to the external world changes when I am asleep, but it's not as if I don't feel or sense anything at all. For example, I still sense the touch of the sheets on my skin. I can still hear very loud noises that can wake me up. And I still can register some visual information that breaks through um, the cover of the eyelids. In fact, if you close your eyes, um, 
you think you see dark, but then if you cover them with your hands, you see even darker, which suggests that you didn't see entirely black before. Rather, you were, ex you were interpreting what you saw as blackness. And so Bergson talks about this phenomenon of some visual stimulation still piercing through the eyelids, and he calls it light dust. There is still light dust that reaches the eyes, that reaches the retina, and that then gets processed by the occipital lobe. And he says, what dreaming is, is the mind taking this very, very minimalistic, very rough sketch given by the senses, the faint sounds, the faint tactile sensations, the light dust that manages to break through the state of sleep, and looking at it and running through the memory bank in order to find the memories that fit that sensory sketch. But because the sensory sketch is so minimalistic, there are so many memories that the mind can throw at it that can be adapted to it. And that explains the bizarreness of dreams. But dreams and everyday perception work according to the same principle. We begin with a sketch provided by the senses and then the mind that actively fills the gaps in that sketch by recourse to memory. Now, to fully understand this theory of perceptual adaptation, we have to keep in mind two things about Bergson's theory of memory, since memory is the central term in this theory. The first one is that Bergson presents memory as an active force. Memory is not just a bank of information that the active mind moves through and searches through almost like um, an explorer moving through an uh, unknown land. Rather, Bergson says, memories themselves are active agents. And so he presents a picture of our memory as a series of actors, all the individual memories that we have stored from past experience, sort of elbowing themselves and elbowing each other like fans at a concert in order to present themselves and assert themselves in order to be selected by the mind. So you can think about the intellect or the mind as the element that turns to the past to look for memories. But then there's also an activity coming from the past where the memories start screaming and the one that is loudest is the one that gets selected by the intellect in order to be adapted to the sensory sketch that is presented. The second thing that is very important to note about Bergson's theory of memory is that memory is all powerful. And this is a really interesting element of the Bergsonian corpus. And that is that for Bergson, nothing is ever forgotten. From the moment we are born to the moment we die, every experience makes its way into our memory archive. That includes the act itself of being born, it includes that one time when your mom dropped you when you were six months old. It includes that sound that the AC made in the background of the classroom when you were seven years old. Everything that has ever happened to you is stored in memory for Bergson. Now, he explains the fact that we don't experience our memory as complete by virtue of the fact that the mind has multiple levels. So he appeals to a topographic model of memory where some are sort of pushed to the bottom of the barrel, they are repressed. And it means that we don't remember them, but under particular circumstances, we could retrieve them. And when we retrieve them, we experience them as if they were new and bizarre, but in fact, they are experiences that we had at some point or another. So think about the act of retrieval as basically literally time traveling in the sense that you are reaching back into the totality of the past, here the past meaning everything that's happened to you, and uh, then the mind reaching back and pulling out some things that you might remember, some things that you might not remember. And that's what explains, for example, again, the bizarreness of dreams. The mind is presenting us very weird things that we don't recognize, but that again, are things that have literally happened to us. Now, although memory is the principal element in Bergson's theory of perception, it is not the only one. Bergson recognizes that when the mind reaches into the past in order to pull a memory so as to adapt it to what the senses are providing, that fit is often very, very good, but it is never perfect. 
And so we might be able to fill in a lot of the gaps. We might be able to color in a lot of the blanks in the sketch that the census have given us, but that job can never be fully completed by memory alone. This is where Bergson says the imagination must come in, take the reins from memory and finish the job. So memory comes in to put the final touches, uh, to fill in the gaps that are left between the content provided by memory and then the perceptual structure, that sketch that is provided by sensation. And so you have on the one hand, what is given to the senses, what the memory gives in. And then at the end, the imagination through its creative power of production, filling in the gaps without necessarily making recourse to something that we have experienced in the past, rather creating new things. Now, toward the end of his lecture, Bergson is aware that there might be a conceptual problem with his theory, which is how exactly are memories selected in order to fit the right sensory sketch, especially given that he has already said that the memories themselves play an active role in their being selected. So who is the actor or the agent here that is unifying memory and sensation? Now, to answer this question, Bergson compares his theory of adaptation to the myth of the origin of life that we find in Plotinus, um, a philosopher from the first century CE who is the founder of the school of Neoplatonism. Now, Plotinus wondered how it is that souls and bodies are united into particular beings. So how is it that my particular soul, the mind that I am, ended up with the particular body that I also am in this unified whole that I also am? I'm getting a little repetitive here, but this is the problem of the unity of organisms. And Plotinus gives a really beautiful myth in his book, The Aeneids, in which he explains how souls start falling from heaven and bodies start rising from nature. And along the way, they sort of find their other half. Um, in Spanish, we say, uh, tu otra naranja, your other orange or the other half of your orange, um, meaning that there is a kind of love and attraction that brings nature and spirit together. And in this lecture, Bergson compares his understanding of how sensation and memory come together to Plotinus's myth about the origin of life. And here I just need to read the passage because I think it really highlights the notion of adaptation. This is Bergson on Plotinus. In a poetic passage of the Aeneids, Plotinus explains how men are born to life. Nature, he says, sketches living bodies, but only sketches them. Left to her own forces alone, she could not complete that picture. So you have nature that produces these inchoate bodies um, that on their own could never rise to the level of a complete living organism. On the other hand, he continues, souls dwell in the world of the ideas. So high above, you have souls. Incapable of acting, and moreover, not even thinking of acting, they lie at rest above time and outside space. So you have nature that produces bodies, the transcendent realm of ideas where souls exist without any sense of action. But, and this is the transition, among certain bodies, there are some which by their nature and form respond more than others to the aspirations of certain souls. So there are some bodies that just listen to what certain souls desire. And among souls, there are some which find their own likeness as, so to say, in certain bodies. So the souls sometimes look down at the material realm and they see themselves reflected in a particular body. It's like they found their other half. The body, he continues, unfinished as it has been left by nature, then rises toward the soul, which can give it complete life. So the body starts moving in the direction, almost as if by desire, uh, in the direction of the soul that already has identified with it. And the soul looking down on the body and perceiving it as the reflection of itself in a mirror is fascinated. It leans forward and falls. So the soul jumps, it makes, uh, it makes a leap of faith, hoping that in the fall downward, in the 
precipitous uh, fall, it will find the body that will complete it. This fall is the beginning of life. And now here's the transition to his theory of perception. I liken these detached souls to the memories lying in wait in the depth of the unconscious and the bodies to our sensations during experience. And so in the same way that souls fall, hoping to find the body that is going to complete them, so to our memories lay in wait until they finally throw themselves, hoping to find a sensory sketch that is going to complete them. And that fall for Bergson is the beginning and the end of perception.